All right, welcome back for another episode of Fifth Generation Leadership. Today with me, I have Kulak, who you can find on an awesome Substack uh, called Anarchonomicon, uh, or on Twitter, where uh, got quite quite a quite a following. So, um, just yes, for- um, Cat Girl Kulak on Twitter. If you're wondering, I'm slightly more famous that way than as an Anarchonomicon. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I yeah, I'm biased because I, I found you originally because of Substack. But yes, I, I did notice that the Twitter following was more, uh, more substantial. Um, so uh, yeah, and it just deeply confuses people, which I quite like that. Um, that the Kawaii Cat Girl branding, um, throws people for a loop, and, uh. I, I always think it's like slightly an insult to write about a lot of this stuff like behind like a uh, anime profile, which I quite like that, um, you know, you comment on something and then it gets like a thousand views and then someone has to respond who's like um, a serious personality at like an institute or something. And they have like five degrees and have to write a response to something written by a Twitter cat girl. That's absolutely brilliant. That actually came up earlier today because uh, uh, John Carter uh, had asked me what he thought, what I, what I thought about your most recent article on the draft, which we could probably talk about later. And um, I asked him, I was like, so is, is you know, is Kulak a, a chick or a dude? Like, what's the deal? You know, what do you think? And he's like, oh, it's a dude, you know. Uh, for sure <laughs> and uh i for me i since i came across your sub stack first you know i thought that you know you you were a dude but then i saw the twitter thing and it kind of broke my brain i was like what what is going on you know because i just couldn't imagine somebody having the audacity to just to just roll with that so i'm i'm impressed i think it's audacious um it's i, I ju- love it because um if you follow my account, I use like AI to like maintain the girl in my PFP. I like um, create AI images of her and um, add cat ears and stuff. I imagine some of you, most of your listeners won't know, know my work, but I create like photorealistic AI photos of like this continuous, continuous girl who's my avatar and like add cat ears and do tons of stuff with it. So like there are thousands and thousands of people who like probably should know that it's a dude writing all these essays that they're reading, but who like desperately, desperately want to believe. I get like a yeah. confession of love every week. That's that's insane, but also awesome. Um, I, I know exactly what you're talking about with the AI images and it is enough that it kind of makes you think it's like, they're clearly AI images, but um, well, I mean, maybe not so clear. The people that you know don't don't see it a lot, but you know the images that you use in your Substack articles. Um, I mean, you, you clearly have a gift for using that technology. I think I remember the Dark uh, Bill of Rights article. I think had a lot of AI generated stuff that uh, that was really really appropriate for the article and and was yeah was that like stuff. Dangerous. I look back on like kind of cringe because like um, the the technology has like move so far so quickly like the apps i use and stuff it's like oh i could have used this instead of like cycling through like five different options and settling on like this thing that doesn't work or like it's very i'm consistently surprised at like how much better uh like ai images you create can get like it's really becoming like the equivalent of like a paintbrush or something that's like okay create this asset photo edit it with this, Photoshop it together with this. Um, like it is becoming its own like little art form. Yeah, and I imagine it's only gonna get more intuitive and that's probably when I'll, I'll get on board with it. Um, so what I wanted to uh, really focus our, our uh, discussion, um, you know, since, since you're in on, I'm not gonna ask like personal questions about your upbringing, but I'm very interested in your philosophical upbringing because of uh, one of the main focuses of your work lately, which I would describe as kind of venturing into discussion, discussing the legitimacy uh, of political violence and just discussing political violence kind of in an open and candid way. 
uh, in an era where that is anathema, people kind of look at it as being um, inappropriate. I would say, I, I think I saw a post on Twitter where you criticize people throwing the term fed post around. And I will admit that I have been one of those people. And so I, I kind of want to talk about that before we talk about that particular subject um what is your philosophical background you know to kind of play off of uh another canadian jeff berwick and he had a podcast called anarchast um that that i used to be a huge fan of and i know that you kind of have and cap leanings uh libertarian uh leanings basing your economic analysis somewhat on austrian economics um, can you walk us through what what your background is in that regard? Yeah, so um, I kind of have like three really big, big um, philosophical schools that influence me. Um, maybe four if you want to throw in like Nietzsche and the new like um, kind of cultural aesthetic, right? That's like taking off now. But of course, everyone knows that one if you follow like BAP or any online figures like that's that's everywhere now so um uh I studied philosophy in university um I I was big into political philosophy and especially um Thomas Hobbes um my thesis was actually on on Hobbes and how um he laid the roots of um what we call phil what philosophers would call liberalism but of course this is like um the tradition of like 16th 17th 18th 19th century liberalism that would become libertarianism and how actually a lot of the seeds of what we'd consider libertarianism today or Whig liberalism back in the 19th century dates back right into um uh leviathan and some of those chapters around like um both his philosophical basis so like Hobbes chapters 13 through 30 are the core of his theory. And then uh, 31 through 64 are him restating it in a way that's compatible with um, Catholic, dog, uh, Catholic dogma. And, and um, one through 12 is kind of him laying the basis for like the idea of social science. So if you read Leviathan and you go into like chapters 20, 21, 22, uh, 26, a lot of his work is actually laying out the entire idea of um, what we'd call judicial review and the idea of rights and the idea that um, the state and the legal system and the sovereign have to set up the laws in such a way that it, like slowly strips away people's rights in response to crimes, but like in this methodical formalized process that they won't rebel. So, so if you think of um, if you think of a court trial system like you're accused of murder, you don't immediately have your head cut off. You have you get get summoned or arrested, and then you're taken to trial, and you have the opportunity to post post bail. And there's an entire ritualized trial process that exists to separate you from the lay population, population, but also give you lots of review review and lots of opportunity to contest the entire process in a way that isn't an open armed conflict. And of course, um, if there's anything exceptional about your case, there's also appeals and all, all these systems where you could get, get pardons that are designed to really, really give you every out and give you a means and from the perspective of a legal system that's trying to execute you, systematically work through and separate you, you from the general populace, your peer group, group, your reputation, all the assets you have that you'd use to rebel against the legal system trying to kill you. So Hobbes is playing this off, is playing it from both perspectives, but he, in the process he lays out basically how the entire liberal tradition and how all of, all of Anglo legal theory is going to develop and legal institutions are going to, to progress for the next 500 years. Like um, 
ideas such as the idea that the that the highest court in the land will review laws and overturn them if they're found not to accord with natural law or um, the pre-existing rights of the population was like fairly alien. Like no institution like that existed on the British Isles, but he lays it out right there as if he's predicting the overturn of Roe versus Wade. It's really incredible to look at the, the history and how he fits into that. And so that in, entire Hobbesian tradition it was the basis of the capstone of my university philosophy work. And at the same time, I was getting heavily into um, libertarianism. And of course, most of your listeners will be vaguely familiar with libertarianism or may themselves have um, been keen on Ron Paul at the time. Um, the second big, big um, philosophical bringing I had was um, listening to lots of libertarian podcasts, reading works from prominent liber libertarians, really getting into the Rothbardian school of libertarianism, so the kind of Mises Caucus, Caucus Mises Institute aligned ways of libertarian thinking. And then the third main one, one that influences me is um, kind of the rationalist sphere online. Um, the Eliezer Yudkowsky, Scott Alexander um, uh, school school of thinking about thinking um, rationalism. Basically, now you'd say it's a failed project that um, it didn't became become a long last lasting school. Um, didn't really deliver on a lot of its promises. Was a very good organizer of a lot of really smart people. Um, I came out of. I wound up in this um, rationalist dis descendant sphere called the Mott, where um, where it's an online forum that debates debates politics and the culture war war Jason stuff with very regular rigorous modes of um, rules of discourse. Um, I'd say so like Mott, Mott as in Mott and Bailey. Was that like a yes, yes? Uh, the Mott dot org. You can go and read stuff there to today that's excellent wonderful discussion forum but um probably probably had the biggest impact on my writing um out of all all that i'd say writing writing posts on the mod probably made me the writer i am today and made my political writing that um compelling and really really remind a lot of my ideas and my aesthetics, like um, my rhetorical style that seems to have a very good responsive um, audience. I People really seem to react well to it, which which like for me, it's just, okay, write this off in like an hour or two, post it, and then, wow, 100,000 people saw that. But um, that really was refined and developed um, debating stuff off on the mod and really engaging with um kind of rationalist norms of discourse and the idea of fallacies and the new yeah. fallacies they discovered um i also participate in a podcast called the bailey which was kind of the semi-official podcast of the mod and still contribute there um the guy who runs it you've seen uh public defender out of seattle excellent guy and runs an amazing podcast but cool. those are the three really big big schools of um thought that for me there's tons of little stuff i read tons um probably the other big one would be like niall ferguson a lot of the um history of finance that came about around 2008 but that that's a minor addition compared to a bunch of the other stuff. But um, like those three schools of thought, um, it's a, occasionally you'll get like an intersection of two of them. So like rationalist libertarians aren't that rare. Um, libertarians that like Hobbes are rarer, but they, they exist. But um, I might be the only one or like one of three who who has like all three backgrounds. 
Yeah. So that thanks. That's actually really uh, that's really helpful. I want to drill down on the whole rationalist thing, um, especially the way that intersects with uh, Austrian school. Because one of the things that I've kind of always thought that uh, rationalists miss that don't have any familiarity with uh, with the Austrian school is the kind of bar none epistemological confidence that we can have that value is subjective. And yeah, sorry, sorry go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, there is... Looking back, um, there is a ton there that um, rationalism especially, um, most of the people who were involved in rationalism were in some way influenced by the Austrian school. Um, libertarian rationalists were very fairly common, but there wasn't really a push to um, integrate a lot of the Misesian ideas around human action and um, uh, the rational basis of economic activity combined with um the subjectivity of values like part of this is the core figures lean more progressive but another part of it was that um a huge part of rationalism the kind of effect of the ultra sphere was um like really wouldn't have played well with a lot of the um those philosophical precepts so um Rationalism, if you read Eliezer Dudkowski's works or a lot of stuff out of the early rationalists, um, a lot of them, basically you read them and it's as if they're trying to bring about the future depicted in like Ian e M. Banks's cultural no culture novels where um, post-scarcity society, everyone lives forever, there's no violence, um, property is, is an outdated idea because it's post-scarcity. Scarcity, all these things that Ian Banks in the culture novels actually kind of takes apart. Like, no, even if everyone lives forever and there isn't scarcity of any kind and identity is like purely malleable, like you can change your race, gender, whatever is like a free action because technology is that advanced. Like there's this huge problem of, of like, we don't just want to own things to like have hedonistic luxuries. It's that we want to exercise power in the world and and like this a uh, lot of like um what Nietzsche would call the will to power or or what Hobbes or others would call being a politi political man having glory uh Aristotle would call call it being someone in a um in a um polity that that the progressive idea of utopia and purely hedonistic man is actually really incompatible with um, both homo economists and like homo politicus. Yeah, so, I was reading something today along those exact lines and it's essentially saying there's kind of an inverse relationship between meaning and decadence. So, you know, as the the material abundance comes that uh, ability for most people anyway to be able to uh, decipher meaning out of that becomes more and more difficult whereas conversely under conditions of suffering you know when things are more difficult uh you know it kind of forces you to find that meaning in order to carry on and so you know more people tend to have it and i think what i was reading is about more society as a whole but uh, I mean, I do think that there's a relationship there and that, or I mean, you could use a ton of, there's a ton of different frameworks, right? There's the whole framework of the fourth turning um, and, and, you know, weak men and hard times, et cetera. Uh, so I, I think that's touching to something that's real, but um, I want to, I want to go back. Yeah. And, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd say, like, it's a consistent trend. Weirdly, it's not really correlated with wealth that much. Um, if you think of, like, the ancient Romans, in a lot of respects, were actually somewhat poorer than, say, you know, 19th century Americans who were the wealthiest human beings who had ever existed 
at the time and were incredibly industrious um that the that the um relationship to to power and decadence is really a state of like the relationship between institutions and people and um i i know it might be a mold bugism that as soon as you're wealthy and have power um the next thing you want to do is free yourself of responsibility that um to be wealthy or to have power is to have re responsibility um which in the most technical sense is that consequences can find you that like you'll be held responsible or that um you could potentially lose what you you have and obviously the possibility of losing like physical things you have yeah you want to secure that you don't want to risk like being being responsible for losing your ship or whatever but at the institutional level like trying to free yourself of the possibility of being held responsible for your actions is like immediately horrifyingly toxic to like any institution uh you can see this with um napoleon had a great moment where um he had just conquered all of uh northern italy um in his first campaign and he had this brilliant plan um napoleon's first campaign you can watch videos on it. it's a thing of extraordinary beauty up there with the greatest works of art but um he said he was talking to his generals who and said you know i was a junior general in the army of italy two years ago and i proposed this exact plan and a council of war was convened of all the generals and they said no and then he clarified that no general under my command should ever convene a council of war for any reason that these committees are cowardly institutions only resorted to to avoid responsibility and you look at modern life and it's like wow we have only committees deciding things that as soon as as soon as people have so much power they immediately stop running things as proprietorships or they stop being like the startup founders or the commanders in chief or the captains instead resort to committees because a committee can never be held accountable. You know, you can never hot, you can never execute every member of a committee for like a failure of command, whereas you can an individual general or you can fire an individual CEO. Whereas if you reconstitute everything as a committee, uh, you're going to be, safe there for life no 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 i didn't propose that plan i was outvoted in this way or that way that you can have the power and the influence but none of the responsibility yeah that's very insightful and and helpful and actually kind of a white pill i mean we know that a lot of the issues that we're facing probably have to do with institutions being captured and you know, so the mediating and positive impact that they had has now been uh, degraded uh, completely. But I would also say that that framing in terms of focusing on, you know, the desire to escape accountability is very much in line with Mises's bureaucracy uh, what what you see in these organizations. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you just from another another feature that you see to complement that exact thing that you mentioned about committees. You know, another thing that's going on, say, in the military right now is you have a bunch of risk mitigation strategies. So a bunch of things that you do to mitigate risk. But the number of tasks and the number of those things exceeds the amount of time that any subordinate commander has in a day. And so at the company level, uh, especially in the army, it's probably universal. Uh, but at that junior command level, you have these company commanders that are have too many tasks and they have to pick and choose which ones they're gonna do. And that way, if anything bad happens, the senior commanders can just be like, well, you didn't do X, Y, Z that you were supposed to do. And I told you to do it. And really the only way to reform it is for people at higher echelons to assume that 
exact risk and tell subordinate commanders, this is what you aren't going to do so that if something bad happens, they can be held accountable for making that risk decision. But they're totally capable of pawning that off and, and putting that down on those subordinate commanders. And it's it's become the norm. And I think that combined with the committees thing, you know, it, it just tells me that people are doing everything they can within these institutions when there's no reality test with institutions. So like in a bureaucracy where there's not profit motive, where there's not some sort of reality test. I mean, the military, you have combat as a potential one, but if it's not with a near peer enemy, that's not nearly as much of a reality test. Uh, so without those reality tests, everybody's going to be just working to try and escape from responsibility and they're going to find very creative ways to do it. Yeah. And it, um, it becomes especially toxic in a democracy because of course you can always pawn on it off on, oh, this failed because of this, this failed because of that. But um, you look like America has lost two plus wars in the past like 20 years against enemies that realistically should have, uh, on paper at least, should have been like complete cake cakewalks. And of course, no one was held accountable. Um, David Petraeus is treated as like a, despite actively leaking higher than top secret presidential orders to his mistress for her tell all book. Like um, he's treated as a, almost a saint by a lot of, of the military and media, media institutions, despite like laying the groundwork for those de defeats. And of course it's because no one expects America to win, win these wars that it's, um, assume the ultimate reason they'll fail is because they're poorly politically conceived at like um, the congressional or presidential level and they and they can always shirk responsibility because it's well yeah this was poorly conceived we couldn't have won these wars but it was really the American people demanding it and once you have like a democracy that's so advanced ultimately like you can always pass the buck up or down and ultimately and even a president who should be responsible for anything can always pack the pass the buck to you know the people demanded or the people bailed him and of course no u.s president has ever been held responsible for for anything donald trump is the first president to ever be charged with anything when many of them actively com many of the historical presidents like actively committed treason or actively subverted the constitution so it's a like you get in this laughable Gordon's knot where absolutely no one can be held responsible for anything. It, it's interesting what you said about junior officers. I I've always been like deeply perplexed looking at the U.S. military. Like, um, how many hours a day junior officers have to be working or working on something? Like, you look at what a junior officer is supposed to be doing, especially in the field, and it's like. 16 20 hours a day sometimes between like working with the troops preparing preparing stuff reading reports like you add it all up and they'll they're even like little documentaries and and promotional stuff where they try to sell the idea of being a junior officer to like prospective west point grads well they'll talk about like oh yes you have to do this much work 18 hour days seven days days a week, et cetera. And you look at their immediate superiors and it's like, well, senior officers aren't doing that. Like um, like every military base has has a golf course or a or you know a yacht club or any number of things for senior officers to be doing. So where are they getting can, all their free time? I can provide some insight on that. So when, when senior officers are in key development positions, they are every bit as busy. So once once you reach field grade, so like command is incredibly busy at whatever echelon, you know, from company to core to major commands, um, they're, they're incredibly busy, you know, just going from meeting to meeting all day. Um, 
that's balanced by what people are doing when they're not in command and when they're not in these key development positions. Um, that's where there's kind of those discrepancies. But I would I would say that in the in the U.S. military, people are pretty busy, and they're going to get yeah. even busier because you know we have a national defense strategy that's based on us having a certain number of troops. And I don't know if you've been following the news at all, but we have uh, pretty serious recruiting and retention issues. So as the size of the force decreases and the operational requirements stay exactly the same, uh, everybody's going to be very busy. Um, and that's that's all the way up and down. That's kind of been the case in the Navy for longer. It's really starting to hit the Army because these recruiting and retention issues are hitting the Army especially hard. But it's across the services. So I wouldn't say that in the U.S. military, we have a bunch of senior officers that aren't busy. I mean, you could talk about how productive they are. And, you know, that's, yeah, so that's, um, that's one of the things I've always found, found like deeply suspect is so many is um, there are so many of these meetings that a, it's a truism of um, just corporate life in America that that half of all meetings, maybe 80% could be emails. And then, and then you think of, okay, well, the Army is doing the exact same, like, diversity meetings and presentations as everyone else. Um, the same, cr the Army is almost worse than a lot of public life for credentialism in terms of, um, in terms of every to do anything or to advance to anything, you have to have a like three week course where you're by instructed by people who know less than you do on how to do the thing that you've been doing for two years. Yeah, there's and, there's serious issues with training management for sure. And but and that always and that always um, surprised me that that um, during none of the wars or maybe maybe during the next war it'll finally be extreme enough that they'll do away with the the diversity meetings or the um, the leadership courses taught by taught by non-leadership instructors uh, uh, I don't I don't think so I don't think that there's anything like I don't think a reality check like that's coming I mean th and we can get into that that's a whole nother topic. Uh, but I, I don't think it's coming because you mentioned, you know, we've lost these last two wars and we could have won. We have the resources to win. We could get into Clausewitz and Will and how that's the decisive factor in any conflict. But I'm partial to looking at it the way that Julian Assange framed it in terms of these large-scale conflicts, like especially Afghanistan, was not so much about achieving any particular objective. It was a justification to wash money out of the tax bases of the West. And towards that end, it was more successful than anything else. I mean, $20, $30 trillion unaccounted for in the in U.S. Department of Defense. So I think that is why a lot of these things happen. I think that's a better explanation of what's going on in, in Ukraine, but that's not the only type of war. Like, I don't think that's how Iraq started, for example. I think that they were very interested in that because of Saddam Hussein being interested in, you know, potentially gold standard, same as, uh, or, you know, making different decisions in terms of how to sell oil, uh, you know, departing from the petrodollar system and same deal with uh, Gaddafi. I don't, I don't think these, this, I, I think it's kind of one of those follow the money things as opposed to, uh, hey, the country has strategic objectives because it comes down to that same thing with accountability, but also motivation. You know, who the people are in charge, the people that are running 
uh, this stuff. Are they loyal to the Constitution? Like the oath that we take? Or are they just mostly creatures of convenience where they're trying to increase their own power and escape accountability? Same as, you know, the all the philosophical analysis going back to Hobbes, maybe. Yeah, so the the question that's always kind of I've never gotten a real real answer for, or I've never found a, a good answer for personally, is um, the theories around the petrodollar, and I I quite like the petrodollar theory, is um, if the U.S. invade Iraq or overthrew Libya to um, secure secure the U.S. dollar and prevent a gold-backed currency, well, who is it that... Um, is like making that decision or like speaking to the generals and the national security people that like, Oh no, 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 no. He's crossed the red line. Now he's, he's threatening to like actually start a gold back, back currency. Um, like the generals well, yeah, who, who started, who started the petrodollar system. Yeah. Like the, the generals who like are theoretically advising all this, I, seriously doubt I haven't heard of any of them that have like economics degrees or would like know enough about economics to actually know all the cadence and arguments for the the like Federal Reserve and the US dollar system and then also know know the like secret reality behind um behind like oh it's actually because of it isn't modern monetary theory it's actually because it's backed by um the world's oil reserves serves like that seems very complex for for the generals to like intuit through the prop propaganda i'm not sure which oh, yeah, no, of them would be reading that stuff and the politicians obviously like like a, ron paul had this story about um he's on the senate finance he's on the house finance committee and a senator asked him, you mentioned the gold standard and and that we're not on it. I thought we were on the gold standard. And this was like the head of the House Finance Committee, like thought they were on the gold standard. That's pretty wild. Like, so like, um, part of me is kind of doubtful that, um, you know, it might be that there's these secret people in like think tanks and um, Raytheon and other organizations. Maybe, maybe someone at CIA or um, maybe maybe their contacts in New York like have it fully mapped out the system. But uh, part of me thinks that it's not so much uh, Saddam and Gaddafi like touch the third rail and like set off the petrodollar panic mode of we have to overthrow these regimes is that um you know they're probably lashing out at u.s control like severing ties with everything and then like some finance minister said to them well we also have like this we are also dependent on them for like the money supply why because of x y and z and they said okay we'll create an what else can we do i don't know we could create something with gold gold and like they stumbled backwards into like saying they're going to do away with the one thing that funds the U S and the U S probably didn't even realize like that was the one thing they should have overthrown them them for. And instead was like doing it because they were mean at like an OECD summit or like um, that they were starting to offend Saudi Arabia more than usual or, or something like um, part of me is is very doubtful that there's a room somewhere in Washington, D.C. or New York where um, someone both has power and knows what's going on. I mean, yeah, the way the policy gets established, um, I mean, it's it's not really a secret. So when I asked who started the petrodollar system, it wasn't like a open-ended question. It's specifically, it's Senator Kissinger. So you have a lot of people in the State Department um that understand these things and like you mentioned yourself think tanks 
So, I mean, that's, that's a lot of who's driving it and it's not secret. You know, they publish things, you know, council on foreign relations, trilateral commission. Uh, they publish things. You can look at, for example, the project for a new American century, you know, prior to nine 11 saying, Hey, you know, what we really need is we need a terrorist attack, you know, something that's really unifying so that we can, that will enable us to go, uh, achieve these desired objectives in the Middle East. So you have, it's the whole system and conspiracy thing. So yeah, there's certain individuals that are engaged in conspiracy that perhaps have a very real politic view. People like Kissinger, people like Madeleine Albright, people like Tory and Newland. And then you have around them an entire system that once that policy is established, they all get in line and execute that policy. You know, we similar things happen with, with COVID, right? Where it's like, why was everybody beating to the tune of the same drum? Yeah, it might have been a small conspiracy in certain places, but once it got going, now it's not managed top down by anybody. It's just a society wide phenomenon that's continues to be perpetuated by institutions and the incentives in those institutions. But yeah, no, I, I agree with your take that I don't think that general officers in the military are thinking about things in terms of real politic as much as they probably should be trained to. They're, yeah, my thing is, like, um, my thing is, though, these institutions, Council on Foreign Relations, Rand, um, Henry, Henry Kissinger somehow is still alive at, like, his age, so maybe he... But, like, he's famously been making phone calls around, like, Ukraine and other things and, like, being ignored. My my impression is that, like, and nothing I've really seen of the U.S. government has contradicted this, is that at this point, all these institutions are operating on kind of a hive mind social signaling logic where um, they'll write things in there as an economy, economy of... Um, you know, if they write the correct propaganda or the correct insight, they'll get a, a promotion or be moved to the next next desk or be rewarded in some way. But my impression is there isn't actually much of an intelligence that forms out of all these committees that is actually capable of making plans more than two steps ahead. That like... Um, yeah, but you don't need to make plans more than two steps ahead in order to set up a grift. So, no, I mean, exactly. People, but um, I, the I thing is, you need of... to be able to make plans more than two steps ahead in order to defend a grift. So, like, um, if the U.S. winds up in a situation where, um, say, Russia wins against Ukraine, like the Zelensky regime collapses at some point, like, um, like Poland or or Germany after their arm. Armies were surrounded, or Germany's a bad example. They fought to the end. But um, most regimes, you know, once they can't fight it anymore, they go the way of the czars and like the armies suffer mass desertions and things just kind of evaporate. Coups in the capital, nothing makes sense. And then the enemy takes most of the land unopposed. If that happens in Ukraine, like I don't think there's actually a, um, a mechanism in the U.S. government to make significant strategic, meaningful strategic plans, like in light of what the global economy is to, to contain Russia or, or like contain the damage. From what I've seen, uh, these guys aren't capable of making strategic decisions, even at the level of, um, of just a strategic pullback and then re-exerting force in like two years. Uh, you see this all the time in in like most democratic regimes where um, uh, actually Ju uh, Germany in the 40s is a very good example of this where um, the Germans had conquered 
thousands of miles of territory. Like, like it, they were a thousand miles from Berlin by the time the Soviet counterattacks were like having major effect. And you think, well, you've taken a thousand miles of territory, and now you're fighting against a country that's larger than you in terms of population, but weaker than you in terms of economy and um, technological prowess and the skill of its soldiers. Like um, Germany, 1941, 1940, 1940, yeah, 1941, 1942. Uh, on paper, it looks like a classic example of a scenario where you'd practice defense in depth, uh, trade, you know, 20 miles of of Russian territory for strategic advantage here, here and there, and whittle down the enemy offensive until they're on the back foot again, and then you win against a weakened opponent. Makes, you know, it's a very classic ta tactic. Whereas what you see instead is as soon as the Russian army is really able to make major offensive offensives and is consulting more men on the on the field and it, even after Germany is being divided across multiple fronts what does Germany do it keeps on ordering counterattacks these these incredibly overcommitting crazed counterattacks that many of them were skillfully carried out but whittled down its army you know lost years and years of the war that they could have stretched it out or like forced negotiation because, and why did they do that? Well, if you look at the command structure, it was uh, Hitler and, and the regime had to maintain the image that they were winning and that the enemy was about to break. And so for domestic political reasons and the reasons of the security of their, their own regime, they have to make all these militarily nonsensical decisions decisions to maintain that um, mutual reinforcing image of loyalty and aggression. And you see the same thing from the U.S. where we're in the Ukraine war or elsewhere. They have to maintain this image of, no, we aren't going to pull out of Afghanistan any sooner than the very last moment, or no, we aren't going to do this or that, or no, we aren't going to make international treaties that make sense or no, we aren't going to push up to the very edge of Russia and start, start a war, or no, we aren't going to let, let Ukraine negotiate, because within the internal game of all these, these elites, none of them are actually in a position where they can actually make an even basic strategic decision. They all have to be signaling 100% loyalty at all times. And that is a very, very disturbing situation that reoccurs and reoccurs in, in democracies because as soon as you get in a, a say, international war with China or, or as soon as you, as Ramaswamy suggested, start, start a military operation about the cart against the cartels, also you're fighting against an enemy that probably could make strategic decisions because it terminates in the actual leader at the top. And you run into a situation where, where you wind up playing the, the AI that only knows three moves in a strategy game against like someone who's actually capable of being a player. Like anyone who plays an RTS or, or any type of strategy games knows the type of AI that can only do three things. And if you find a glitch, it will keep, keep making the same horrendous decision over and over and over again. And I suspect the U.S., one of America's enemies, is going to find find one of America's glitches pretty soon. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why they need to maintain a transnational global empire. You know, that's so. It's like you you said about they had to be loyal. I don't think that they're so concerned about popular opinion within the U.S. because they feel like they can shape that with you know, this vast AI driven censorship. Oh, no, no, no. They're loyalty so to so each far. other so that they aren't a, a heretic. Um, they have to, yeah, yeah. yeah. They for have example, to... they, America last eight years, last um, eight years has burned through 
so much of its domestic legitimacy, um, going after Trump in the most obscene ways that was completely unnecessary because Trump was a clown. Like, you could have, um, you know, signed a deal that gave him nothing, say, look, Donald, you want a great deal, and, like, do that two or three times, and next thing you know, he's out of office. He was as, as impotent a populist as, like, Reagan's last term. Like, it would be very easy to contain Donald Trump by just, like, pretending he was, like, winning something but actually giving him him nothing. And instead, you know, they burned through decades worth of the regime's legitimacy and domestic goodwill uh, because every individual actor could advance their career by doing the next obscene, obscene ridiculous thing going after Trump. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I, I do think that that is a feature of what's going on. In terms of what happens if, you know, Russia collapses and the fallout, yeah, I, I agree with you. They're not thinking about that. I think insofar as people are considering the problem, uh, the, the people with influence, I think it has everything to do with energy, you know, so like natural gas, washing money out of the tax bases uh, with, with handouts that everybody gets a piece of. And on the Russian side, they have, they're contending with the exact same issues, you know, where we got central bankers on each side of the conflict, um, you know, like Shoigu is not, I, I don't think Shoigu is any more interested in doing what's right for the Russian people than um, our leadership is doing what's right for the American people over all of their considerations. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I just, I do think that there's, I mean, you, you mentioned being into, you know, political philosophy. As soon as you get into constructivism, it's like, we, I mean, we got just a bunch of individual actors. It's just, it gets very recursive and very difficult to, because I mean, at the end of the day, we're speculating and trying to come up with a model that's somewhat describing what's happening. And for all we know, there's pieces of information that would totally invalidate the model that we're trying to do and put together to understand it. But um, I, I think the, you know, what, what we can both be confident of, right, is the official narrative is totally garbage and not, not helpful. And that anybody that's trying to provide you know, uh, an analysis grounded in political realism is not subscribing to the official narrative. Um, but, so I wanted to pivot off of war because I wanted to go back. I, I kind of want to go try and get into some some more of the philosophy stuff, if you don't mind. And Absolutely. One thing I was really, that jumped out at me is you mentioned judicial review talking about Hobbes and this kind of relates I, I'm going to try and walk towards you know d discussing political violence political solutions to the situation we're in and the like costs and benefits of, of talking about political violence in whatever context but to start off with judicial review um, something that I've come to believe you know, and I could just be biased because I swore an oath to the Constitution, but I've kind of come to believe that swearing an oath to the Constitution, you're essentially swearing an oath to natural law, and that the Bill of Rights and natural law interacts with that judicial review process in such a way that it's essentially compatible with anarcho-capitalism at, at kind of a deep level. Because you have this adversarial process set up in America's judicial system, which I think recognizes at some level that nobody is a complete and full arbiter of the truth. Like we don't have a human being that knows the truth. So we have to have this process. And what's a better process when we can't defer to anybody than to have 
an adversarial process where each side's advocating for their position. And then who decides? It's not a judge. It's not a member of the state. Ideally, in accordance with Bill of Rights, it's an impartial jury. You know, and so it's not perfect, but we're we're trying to get somebody, a group of people who are impartial, um, and who selects those people for their impartiality. A couple attorneys that are engaged in an adversarial process. So I think that that all kind of comes together, and aligns with the non-aggression principle. And so the government can create laws, like for example, drug laws. But if you have a reasonable right, uh, you know, if, if the state needs probable cause in order to search you, then, you know, even even victimless crimes, like they become not really crimes until they spill out into the public sphere. And then, of course, at the edges, this gets violated. But I wanted to get your thoughts on that and then transition into how the how the freedom of speech covers discussion of political violence or not. I mean, I, I think it does. I think you read, read, wrote something that indicated that, that I agreed with and then um, pros and cons. Yeah. So um, when it comes to judicial review and jury trials, um, it's very important to study other legal systems just because there's so much about um, the English, the English Anglo-American uh, system of justice is actually very unique and very kind of accidental. And you have to really dig back into the entire history of, of um, Anglo law going back to Magna Carta, but also to like really obscure, obscure stuff related to just um, the traditional the traditions of the English people, of which might even date back into the Saxons. It's a very odd evolution that that continues largely because, because the English never had a Napoleon. Um, they never had someone who completely restructured the legal system and, and the English kept their legal system functional th throughout that time. So a lot of the things we think of as like foundational and completely rational parts of the English legal system are actually these very arcane, like bizarre, almost Viking uh, traditions that that are quite unique to that specific island. If you look at, say, Finland or like Scandinavia or a lot of European countries that you'd think are like, like, um, I won't bring human biodiversity or any of that into it, but for various reasons, you'd think, well, okay, maybe maybe people in China or people in Africa would do things completely differently and their legal systems might be entirely different. But you think like, you know, the English and the Germans or the English and like the Poles would have very, whatever natural law is for one of those, it would hold for both of them, but the legal systems are completely different. In like Finland, for example, the police are basically empowered to search you without a warrant at any any time. Um, in Germany, uh, the exclusion rule that um, if the police illegally search your house, like um, evidence they find isn't admissible, that doesn't hold in Germ Germany. Um, it's a now, mind you, in Germany, if the police did that, they would also immediately be charged because Germany doesn't have uh, prosecutorial discretion. Uh, the prosecutors have to charge every single crime they're aware of, which is interesting. But um, if you look across the pen penalty of um, European legal systems across time, it's like a Star Trek episode. Not a single one is like any institution that like you think would be at all possible given knowledge about one of the others. Like um, bizarre things that Captain Kirk will encounter on alien planets are like more intelligible to the average American than a lot of European legal systems. So the idea of natural law, uh, natural laws and natural rights 
like um obviously they do hold because you look at these systems it's like okay they all have a market economy and no your company isn't going to be nationalized if you set it up up there and like property seems to hold across all of them and people aren't being like violated and, and searched and having horrendous things done by the state to them all the time they all look on the surface like um what we consider a normal functional society that respects natural law but the actual infrastructure that does does that is like alien species landing yeah, on the all, same they thing all, they all get there by some radically different method yeah and like um given knowing about one of them you'd actually think getting getting at the same result via like if you look at the english system of law law and think okay this is how the english system achieves achieves like a system that respects natural rights and like something approximating justice and like protecting the property of its population and then you look at the french system like not only are they different but given that you know about one of them you think the other one would be the exact opposite of what sh of what you would do to achieve it like you think the other one it should be impossible and that's very 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 interest interesting and like very disconcerting for anyone trying to come up with like a rational legal theory that accords with national natural law and you can't even say well they evolved differently in these bizarrely different ways because the french system didn't evolve uh napoleon wrote it all it all comes out of the napoleon on a code it was like a rational progress project to create it so it's not even like oh some institutions have to evolve over time and like like the selection forces of yeah like there's not produces. yeah it's not evolution there's not there's not consilience based on evolution it's yeah but then the different. english system did did evolve entirely and like you cannot point to anything in the english system that is not an evolutionary process so so law part of me wants to say that that almost all theories of law you can come up with are going to be deeply unsatisfying just based on it like it's it's this fractally anti-intuitive like anti um What's the word? Um, oh, there's a phrase for this. Um, uh, counter empirical phenomenon where it almost seems like the legal systems try to avoid really intelligibility and try to guard their secrets from you. But um, in terms of um, you want to talk about speech and natural and um political discourse and um how it relates to political violence yeah, so absolutely. i, I want to just say that what you're saying before though you think private law is kind of the solution there or like private law is a recognition that there is not one right way to do it uh, so the thing with private law is, um, like, as a concept, I can see why it exists. As a reality, I don't think it's a distinct phenomenon. So, like, um, if you think of, like, pr what is law? Law is um, the means of settling political, political disputes. So, okay, private law has to be able to enforce itself some way or appeal to, like, another legal system to enforce it. So, like... Um, higher chips had a, a pri private law system. They had their own means of, of dispute resolution. Um, it might be the captain is empowered to decide certain things. It might be that um, they have trials where all the crew acts as jury, or it might be that they resort to trial by combat. But um, you look at that and it's like, well, okay, is that private law? Or is that like a little state of 40 people aboard a wooden piece of land? And, That's a good point. and it 
as soon as we're talking about law, it's like, okay, it can be larger or small, smaller, you know, it might be two people, two or three people deciding how they're going to resolve their disputes, but it's not fundamentally different from, from like, okay, you can either enforce it with lethal violence or you can't, in which case, like, it's a sovereign, it's just a matter of scale. Yeah, that makes sense. But, um, in terms of like um, discussion, discuss, and this is partly why um, I, I've written so much about discussing political violence is because um, political violence, the phrase, is a redundancy. You know, you aren't discussing political violence, you're discussing the political. Yeah, politics. Yeah. If anything, if you're discussing anything you're in politics, you're discussing okay, what are the rules going to be and how is it going to be enforced? And implicit in any discussion of rules is that it's going to be enforced. You know, it might be Tony Soprano discussing who they're going to whack or what they'd whack someone for. for and it's like, oh, that's conspiracy to co commit murder, blah, 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 blah. That's racket racketeering. But you look at, okay, we're going to pass a law that... Um, that this tax is going to be applied, and if you don't collect it or you don't don't pay it, enforcers are going to show up to arrest you and drag you away to a prison. And if you resist, they will use violence against you. And if you resist more effectively by reaching for a weapon, they'll kill you. That's uh, I've wrote a piece, the Iron Rule, about this. That um, you know how the mob enforces it's um, extortion rackets and how taxmen enforce their um, their taxes is the exact same system, like right down to the individual steps of, okay, then they charge interest. Okay, then they come and take your property or put a lien against it. Okay, then they enforce the taking or the lien. Okay, at that point, you're being confronted by an armed agent of either the mob or the state who is going to either less than lethal violence, you know, physically tackle your one on, drag you away to prison or like, in the case of the mob, just kick the shit out of you. And then at that point, if you resist, you resist in a way that's actually effective and like, they might not be able to drag you away to prison, then they come, then they either leave and come back with guns or if or they draw their gun and shoot you. That any discussion of any political possibility is ultimately terminating in implicitly in someone enforcing it with lethal violence. In all scenarios, in all cases. And if if that's not implicitly hiding behind the political cool discussion, it's not a political discussion, you're a sewing circle. Yeah, you know, well, I mean, you're I, practicing I, gossip. I would say that the, um, you know, the distinction is if you're talking about changing the current political system uh, outside of the rules of that political system. So, you know, it's not that you're using violence. It's that anything that violates the rules of the system that you're trying to change, uh, you know, is that on the table you know because as soon as that's on the table you lose like if you're talking about it openly you lose legitimacy i think and you mentioned you know the the regime's lost a lot of legitimacy and what they've done with uh, donald trump and i i agree with that 100 percent. i think that it all does come down to legitimacy but i also think that that's why engaging in the political following the rules is critical and it's that's kind of the, the thing though the actual it. rules of the political system versus the um like the actual rules of the system a do not line up with whatever the written rules are basically in every scenario because there's always unwritten norms etc donald trump uh they talk about oh he's a threat to our democracy he's violating our norms well, he obeyed all the written, 
written rules, you violated the unwritten rules that you don't. Um, well, it's just yeah, that's a problem. Threaten to enforce the law against Hillary yeah. Clinton, or you don't, or you don't. Um, well, no. So there, my, my point is, is that everything that they've done in response, like like you said, he followed the rules, and they've done a lot of things in response that have broken the rules. I'm arguing that that is what's caused the like. That's how you can describe in fundamental terms why there's been a loss of legitimacy like uh yes but um what i'd what i'd say had what i'd say is that the actual rules uh is fundamentally unwritten in both good ways and bad so for example um why has there not been been a gun ban in the u.s well there's a second amendment and all that, but constitutional amendments become dead letters all the time. You know, judges come up with interpretations and slowly constitutional amendments rise or fall. You know, the Fourth Amendment doesn't cover the NSA, say, and the Third Amendment functionally doesn't exist, but also doesn't exist for like, um, you know, the military can violate the sanctity of, of your home, A, with the NSA again, but B, uh, stuff like mask mandate mandates and tons of other regulations that they desperately tried to apply within in the home in various ways there was no third amendment appeal against that but so you ask why does the second amendment hold so well in the, the u.s well because there's an implicit threat inherent in the second amendment and in the hearts of the people of the u.s that if you did away with the second amendment and tried to confiscate guns they respond with violence. This isn't. This is a major part of American life that that one of the largest political factions in America and broad swaths of the American people hold in their heart that a violation of the Second Amendment, like a national gun ban or an attempt at mass disarmament, justifies lethal violence. This isn't me saying this as a Canadian. This is this is what. A, vast swaths of the American public believe, countless commentators have said, and the fact that there's this implicit threat in American life is, you know, it's not written down in any law, but it's functionally part of the law and functionally part of um, part of the constitutional law of America that no, the Second Amendment is sacred and it's backed up with violence, and presumably if violence ever did erupt, like, uh, not like a governor or or the U.S. government actually successfully tried to implement a gun ban and violence did erupt and they inevitably lost. Like the legal order that brought about the peace, peace that ended that scenario, you can imagine this happens in lots of regimes where um, there's some tyrannical overreach, uh, the people rise up in rebellion and then actually it all negotiates out after some amount of violence occurs and pardons are passed all around. Like you can imagine the US legal system in such an area would de facto de facto declare a lot of the violence practiced in the name of defending the Second Amendment as constitutional le legitimate. So at what point did it become would it have become constitutional and legitimate? Is it right now when everyone's pausing the legal theory that no rebellion is justified to defend the Second Amendment and gun ownership? Would it, would it be during the reality of like violence is actually being practiced during this hypothetical rebellion? Or would it be afterwards when the pardon is actually, actually passed? And the, the answer is that the actual legal, cultural, political tapestry that that everyone's participating in and debating it, of what the rules are, what what's criminal conspiracy, what's what's a, what's criminal conspiracy to violence, what's actual violence, what's lawful constitutional speech, uh, what's actually you know righteous enforcement of the law or de facto law and what's criminal violence itself 
all that is not a matter of written law. It's a matter of this nebul nebulous tap tapestry and constantly evolving set of set of ideas and value and how they interact with with more timeless natural natural laws. And this is why I think think I'm trying to say that no, 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 advocating advocating or discussing violence or political violence outside the limits limits of some written arrangement or some um, some system that some authority figure is currently saying is the legitimate regime regime or the legitimate way of doing things is just not how things work and not how things have ever worked. You look at um you look back into the history of Western legal systems and stuff like um like the Holy Roman Empire or um England during the War of the Roses and stuff like that. And you find these elaborate long theories of law that are developed to to A justify all the sides of the various wars that developed and their inheritance rights, but B to end those wars and and legitimize why all the sides sides of it were justified in their whatever military actions they partook in and why the peace that they came to and negotiated has actually been implicit in law and every action they took was legal throughout throughout everything they did. And, and you can see these long histories and legal traditions where these semi-sovereign entities, you know, duchies with like 200 people or universities that had like five armed men and whatnot became semi-sovereign for for x or y purpose purpose and then didn't and then either faded out or indeed became part of the larger political entities or in some cases are still around today you know monaco and Liechtenstein still exist in their small bizarre little worlds and yeah. and when you look at that wide history it's it's not a case of no there are a set of, set of written rules or there is a a system in which we are all living, living under or there's a an entity with legitimacy that provides legitimacy to everything else it's more that we're in in a constant fluxing ground up tapestry of sovereignty and rights and and de facto norms um uh, for example, America, for at least the past 50, 60 years, but much longer, has had a tradition of civil disobedience and and protests that verge on illegality. Legality and de facto nudge, nudge, wink, wink, uh, appeals to to riots and other forms forms of property and other other crime. You know, Martin Luther King would march through town. And then, you know, six hours later, a riot would follow. And he'd always say, oh, I'm being being peaceful. And people would, and the various legal authorities would always try to ch charge him with inciting a riot or or leading a riot. And, and of course, letters letter from Birmingham jail was written from Birmingham jail. But you look at how the American legal system adapted to this and like de facto codify that as a legitimate thing to do and it's like well what's the legal theory behind that why does that get legitimacy and it's like well it doesn't come from a top-down legal theory it arose organically and other things could arise organically just just as well um it's very likely that in the next year or two the january 6 protesters are going to get a presidential pardon. Um, either Donald Trump comes back into power and gives them a presidential pardon, or Joe Biden, on his way out of office, either before he's he steps down or before um, or before he loses to Trump, 
or possibly in 2028 after he's won and surprised any, everyone by staying completely completely in the office while descending into senility. Um, the thing I've seen speculated is that at the end of his term, he's probably going to pardon Trump, Julian Assange, the Jan 6 protesters, and then himself and his son Hunter Biden and several other, other major Democratic figures that he can say, oh, I'm helping America put all these issues behind ourselves. Selves. Yeah, and I think the, I've seen Robert Barnes mention that as a possibility. Yeah, yes, it was Barn. Barnes. That that seems to be what he's setting himself up to, to do, that he gets to play peacemaker while also pardoning everyone in his own, own circle. And the question is then, well, after the president's pardoned all these people and no one is charged with Jan 6 or um, Julian Assange walks free or Donald Trump is no longer being charged with his crimes, which actually this would be a brilliant play on the part of Biden. Part of me thinks that Barnes is attributing more intelligence to him than, and his followers than um, is actually there. But um, the question is then, well, if that seemed, if that's what happened and it seemed inevitable it was going to, to happen all along, and in fact, there'd be a whole ton of political fallout if it didn't happen, you know, was Jan 6 de facto legal? Was all the stuff Trump did de facto legal or um, effectively recognized as perfectly legal? Um, is Julian Assange once again the greatest journalist of our age? Age, and was he always? And the answer is, is well it's not going to be found in whatever legal theory you posit or whatever hagiographies about the power of the presidential pardons are. It's going to be a ground of effect of the, of the cultural and personal power all these figures had. You know, it's not going to be because of, of some attribute of Biden or the presidential pardon that the Jan Six protesters had to be had to be pardoned along with these figures. It's going to be because they had that much cultural force, and the movement meant that much, and that faction of American life had carved out such a part for themselves in the tapestry of American political reality. Yeah, I like this tapestry framework because it is what it's like, and then. You know, just thinking about where the line is, you know, because the, you know, it's rule of law. And you mentioned, you know, there's unwritten rules. Uh, there's also things like nullification. That's a logical consequence of the rules. Um, but that goes both ways. Prosecutorial discretion. All these things that if you have people who aren't virtuous and moral, who are, are vicious and sociopathic, they can all be weaponized in a, in a manner that's truly horrific. Yeah, and so, yeah, and they can all, and within the weaponization, all of them have like, um, all of them have degrees. So like there's a level of weaponization where it's like, oh, that would cause a complete revolt and a complete rupture in the tapestry and like a small little, you know, maybe not a civil war, but certainly like in some district, something approaching civil strife. Strife, and then there's like slightly less of a violation where it's like, oh, that won't cause civil strife, but it will like poison the institution and burn through a lot of its legitimacy. And and then there's slightly like this where it's like, oh, that was completely illegitimate, but like we all kind of accept that. Um, anyone who holds that judicial position or anyone who kind of has that power gets to like tie themselves that much discretion and power as like one of the benefits of their office office. And um, the, the answer is like, it's really an effect of like a lot of the un, unwritten, unwritable uh, balancing that happens within the culture and within 
like the legal realities. Um, I I've wanted to write this paper for a while, and I had no venue to do it. Talking about um the synthetic objective, uh, Kant had this theory. You know, there's a priori knowledge, um, and there there's non a priori knowledge. But then he came up with his concept of the synthetic a priori and he tries to say math is like this because oh it takes work and whatnot and i i i'm not sure how i feel about hobbes uh kant's theory but um one of the things that i wanted to write about was um the objective subjective distinction and how a lot of um kind of subjective cultural values actually wind up being objective facts facts through the reality of human institutions. So like market prices, you know, value is subjective, but, um, and just like your feelings about paintings or whatever, but actually if you go yeah, to a market- seem, Prices seem very objective. They're, yeah. Listed yeah, if you go sale. to the market um, uh, to trade your stocks, you're going to be given a price and sure, that's the sum of thousands of people's subjective valuation of that stock. But when they all come together, it becomes like a very hard objective thing that you can track on a ticker and is. I thought, is I'd say that pretty... that's just an illusion. I'd say that's just an illusion because a price only exists at that moment of transaction. And that's the whole point. That's what. Yeah, yeah, that's. Useful. But so, like, it, it true, is subjective. But there's lots of other it's just things. an illusion that it's objective because because uh, of the no, system no, no. that the, makes it seem um, more consistent. The objectiveness of it is that people act on their subjective values, and that creates objective hard hard realities. So, for example, a an army in the field, um, Napoleonic armies, ancient armies, uh, in many val battles there'd come a point where the army broke where just enough people in the army looked at themselves looked at each other and decided we can't win we're going to going to run or i will die if i stay here i'm going to run and the fact enough people in the army subjectively think that makes it so that um if you're in an army that starts to to break and route you you can think, no, we can win this. We can win this as much as you want, but if the guy next to you doesn't, doesn't you thinking it doesn't make it make it so, but enough of you thinking it would that um, the reality of the interaction of like individual rational choice, uh, individual choices based on subjective values and and the collection of them into a social phenomenon creates this synthetic objective objective phenomena where i like that yeah i like that calling it a synthetic well, yeah i like that that makes where, sense where um it's these aren't objective facts but them all but enough people coming together who believe them all suddenly it becomes a social phenomena which has very very hard hard effects on people yeah, on a par more, with any objective reality, like that, there's might nothing be, more powerful than descriptive norms and yeah. modified behavior. Yeah, that um, that you know, something as nebulous as morale might have more of an effect on a battle than like the objective lay of the land. So, I that, mean, I'd, yeah, I'd argue it's everything. Morale is every like will will is everything. You know. Yeah, and, and, and everything else feeds into will, mind you. And and will impact those sort of subjective perceptions, but you know, and what if, if an enemy's will is broken, that, the fight's um, over. That's a defect. Is that political institutions? So, um, so whether or not a protest is a, a legitimate protest or an insurrection, and um, you know, what's the difference between January sixth and Martin Luther King's illegal march down through Birmingham, and Alabama, like? Those aren't determined by a, by seemingly objective qualities of law. Those are determined by the synthetic objective realities of um, kind of social. Save the populace. Oh, yeah, I'd save the populace, and that's why you know 
Uh, like I'm a big fan of Robert Barnes. That's why I call myself a populist. I think that that's what the uh, greatest political challenge is to the current regime is populism. I think they understand that that's an existential threat, but really what that to me is tying into is trying to tap into that synthetic objective and uh, move towards that because I have somewhat of a trust in, you know, typical people, you know, normal people in order to kind of right the ship. I think that that's a good, and then, and then also at the edges, you have an ability to influence that, you know, by arguing, persuading, you know, uh, interacting, doing things. But I would love to read that article. So if you publish it to your stack, like I'll be looking forward to it. Yeah, no, I'll have to to write it. And I I agree with the overlap with populism that that's um, part of the reasons they're responding so violently to stuff like the Canadian trucker convoy and stuff like that is um, like a lot of these... I almost want to distance myself from the label distance from the label populist because it's not like economic populist like um, you know these right wing socialist regimes in South America that um, you know want to be have like heavily progressive states but um, you know socially conservative in some way they never live up to it's the populists are the populist threat is the threat of popular democracy that the that the general public will start treating democracy the way they treated in the 19th century instead of the way they treated it throughout the late 20th century where it was just a a boring curiosity of um elites who fundamentally all agree with each other and that's a good thing like the threat that Americans will start treating elections the way they did in the 1890s and actually demanding people who who represent them and are of them and who want to wield power in ways that are completely anathema to to the people who ruled it before the election and be kind of a revolt against the managerial revolution of Burnham that Burnham identified that that the regime is deeply, deeply threatened by the idea that um, the public is now uh, is now threatening to um, use their numbers to to actually change the subjective rea- the synthetic objective reality of the country, the the collective subjective will. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in, in what you said about Latin America and about how populism having different character everywhere you go, I think that's a benefit, not, uh, you know, I, I think I think it's pure. Oh, yeah, I just meant that some people use it as a technical term that. Um, no, no. So, so yeah, since it's economic left, social conservative. Right. In yeah, the U.S., it's, it's almost it's... the opposite where um, yeah. not in the. Not in a beltway libertarian way, but um, Americans tend to be actually fairly libertine in terms of um, sexuality. Even if you go to like mega churches and stuff, and like evangelical Rust Belt stuff, there's kind of there's kind of this bizarre libertine culture where um, where s- Southern men will cheat, 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 and then pray, 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 and then the couples will generally find some way to forgive you give each other for them whilst being incredibly economically like independence minded minded that um if you look at the general american population they actually kind of fit the description of that um that libertarian idea but in a way completely anathema to how the the elite means it that um that no they hate regulations and occasionally they cheat on each other not um the way the elite means it that they like worship gay people and want free trade agreements yeah and in america like you mentioned the south being different like that's i think that that's the beauty of federalism 
is it facilitates a kind of populism where you know the the character of the rules and the regulations it's better aligned with the people and i i mean i i see that as the the big battle that's going on is between global homo on one side and global populism which is going to be you know highly multipolar all throughout the world as the alternative and i kind of also view everybody on one side or another of a schmidian friend enemy divide where they're either facilitating one vision and outcome or they're facilitating the other on balance yeah and especially if you um one of the great tragedies of like the past 50 60 years has been how culture has really kind of shriveled up and died around the world like if you look at um basically anywhere on earth on earth there's are there are these incredibly rich local cultures that are incredibly specific um have these very distinctive norms and um obviously sexual politics one, one of them but rituals um how they relate to their social institutions um how they achieve how they fit into certain industries and stuff and their their realities around like their climate and whatnot the south of the U.S. is a very big example of how just like different it is from so many places in so many different ways. And if you and you can go to like northern Ontario or other places, and it's the the same story where where it's not only oh this is so different, but but tons of things are completely different because the climate climate is so variable or the the people who settled there are so dis so distinctive and it's just fractally different and it should be developing its own its culture in its own way and these places should be producing this incredibly rich and varied tapestry of human life and for the past 50 60 years these rich cultures have been like fading and dying out because we had highly centralized versions of media and highly centralized states that were enforcing a uniformity both in institutions but also in like spirit that um that if you what? go from one end of america to the other or like even into canada anywhere that had the same language watching the same the same sitcoms with the same values trying to inculcate the same politics in the same way of living and it's it's very shocking now that we live in the internet and we can see just just culture and aesthetics exploding in like incredibly unique unique ways that um that how much that's been suppressed for 50 plus years well, I think you hit the nail on the head for the central cause when you brought up the managerial revolution. You know, that that managerial revolution and uh, the rise of managers has made it so that homogenization allows for easier wealth extraction. You know, the centralization benefits the managers. So it's just a bunch of people moralizing their self-interest and working towards these ends and you know, after they consolidated that power, you know, they're just continuing to do so without, I don't think even understanding the downside consequences and how the result of that is a homogenization that destroys these particularized cultures that, uh, I mean, I suppose I find intrinsically enjoyable. You know, if I go travel, I want the place that I go to to be very different from where I'm from. And I also don't expect, you know, I'm kind of a weird guy. I don't expect where I live to have everybody that agrees with me because that would be a very strange place. It's not, it wouldn't be natural, you know. Um, but this this obsession with uh, technocracy and finding these best practices, which don't I don't think exist, but they fool themselves into thinking that they exist and then try and establish them across every place on the entire earth. 
uh, and, and imagine they're doing some wonderful thing uh, as, as an effective altruist would. Yeah. Um, so the managerial revolution um, is actually very interesting exactly when it ended. I don't so, think it um, ever ended. I think it's still ongoing. No, no, no. I I suspect that the managerial revolution, so the managerial revolution uh, for your listeners was this moment when um, in the early 20th century when the bureaucrats really seized power, power and centralized institutions took over, over life. So the state rapidly expanded its number of employees. The amount of regulation it can force on ordinary people just exploded. And it was this real rise of this class of people who were neither bourgeoisie nor proletariat nor lump proletariat criminals nor aristocrats. This... Um, kind of university educated bureaucratic class that gets called the elite but is really really just this bureaucratic not even middle manager because of course a middle manager fits in the hierarchy and has people who immediately answer to him and people he immediately answers to and that a lot of these people don't like they don't you can't follow the org chart down for most of them and find, you know, a proletariat actually working with his hands. Um, it's just this bureaucratic class that kind of perpetuates itself. And one of the interesting things about bureaucracy is in the early 20th century, bureaucracy had a widespread perception that it was efficient. And this is kind of incomprehensible to people today, you know, the idea of red tape and paper, paperwork and all this stuff and the useless bureaucrat wasting their time. The average American, and this is one of the beautiful things and one of the things that I find greatly white-pilling, is that the average American thinks of bureaucrats as complete time wasters, useless, and bureaucracy and red tape as as a complete obstacle to them getting on with their life. That wasn't the case in the early 20th century because um, the early 20th century was the first time that a lot of these institutions existed. And the way to get around most hard technical problems, the first time you do it, is to create a massively large institution to just brute force the problem. So if you think of um, uh, communications, uh, communications massively shrank down from weeks to hours when the telegraph came about. How do you make a telegraph come about? Well, you have to create a massive centralized organization to draw these big maps of where you're gonna lay the telegraph line. You've gotta lay out the telegraph line and then you gotta have um, people set up every few miles to, to relay the t telegraph and reroute it and if you build this massive bureaucracy, all of a sudden you can do something that was completely impossible before. You can send a message from India to London in the span of two hours or so. So, and because of this, because there were so many things that you could do that way, that you could could organize a mass of people and solve these incredibly complex technical problem problems that would be impossible for anything. In, less than that there's this perception throughout the early 20th century um uh the early progressive era about 1900 to 1950 or so that these bureaucracies were incredibly incredibly efficient and that they were the idea of a centralized organized bureaucracy was obviously going to replace everything that you'd get out there in the market where everything's anarchic and disorganized and it's just just, oh, these uneducated people bring stuff together and then and then haggling and trading them. That isn't efficient. That isn't like these highly educated guys in suits solving these huge, huge technical problems. And this was true throughout the 20th century. And the question is, well, when did that change? When did public perception switch so that suddenly people think of the market as like this incredibly efficient lean thing and bureaucracies as these, these bloated wastes, wastes of time and people doing nothing for no, 
no reason than collecting a paycheck out of your tax dollars for it. And as far as I can tell, bureaucracy and the managerial revolution was kind of over and dead by the 1970s. Like, Star Trek was kind of the last cultural vestige of that idea of um, the hierarchical organized bureaucracy as um, benevolent and leading to a a bright and and adorable future where there will be universal abundance and no one will trade in money and everyone will be equal except for like their rank assigned by the by the centralized hierarchy of the federation. After that, you get like um, it was right around this this time that libertarianism and the hippie movement was taking off the hatred of the man and all these centralized institutions, the loss of the Vietnam War. And um, there's even a book written about it. The, um, what was it called? The Best and Brightest. There are several books written about um, about the people who lost the Vietnam War and how they completely embodied this ideal of the bureaucracy and this centralized organizational man. Robert McNamara was almost the avatar of this who went from Harvard and the university system to to GM to the to running the U.S. war, the complete organizational man who embodied this ideal of bureaucracy. And, of course, A, he was the first first guy to run a lot of those um, car companies who was not one of raised up from the institution itself. So um, he wasn't like um, the Dodge family or any of these these great industrial families who knew cars cars very well and knew the industrial process very well these um kind of industrialist arch capitalist um some would call them robert billions but highly technical people who understood the companies and the markets inside and out like real products of capitalism no he was an organizational man kind of embodying the world war ii generations ideal of what institution should be. And of course, that was the exact high point of the American automotive industry. Immediately after he was there, also it was Rust Belt decline. And then immediately after Robert McNamara was in charge of the war in Vietnam, it was the decline of US military prestige and the US government's prestige. And of course, there's Watergate and there was the, the decade of malaise in the 70s. So re really, I'd say the I'd say the era of the managerial revolution ended in like 1972, and what we've been living with since is like this long hangover of like these bureaucratic institutions that have lost their sheen and like very objectively aren't what's driving society forward. Um, if you look at um, you know, where we look for technological development, it's either startups, which are like the smallest unit you can get away with that, that you can throw millions of dollars at, but don't have to comply with, um, with um, civil, with various diversity laws because they haven't crossed an employee threshold. You know, you don't, you can still have 15 white guys in a room, but if you get 16, you have to hire higher women or minorities, you encounter this with um, with where we look for art. We're always looking for the next great artist. The idea that the Hollywood studio system is going to produce like the next great culture moving piece of art is long, long dead now. In fact, the Hollywood studio system is synonymous with, with like really at this point, very stale and awful art. The, I don't know anyone who's going to see the next Marvel movie. And you can see this across the board where pretty much every institution that was once, that in the 50s or 60s would be expected to leave the culture forward is both held in contempt and there's some like small, 
small niche uh, market actor who we're expecting to outform them. And that small niche market actor almost always does. Um, our public intellectuals today are not even, are not university professors. Like, um, I don't think anyone is listening to podcasts of tenure track um, university university adjuncts or or hirees in philosophy or the humanities departments we because they're Dave, that decayed. And, you know, there's onesies and twosies, but no. So I so let me I, let me address some of that because I I agree with you on the trajectory of what the working class thinks and where the energy is um but the managerial class is still very much in the midst of i would say later stages of that same managerial revolution so while that sheen doesn't exist in the in the synthetic objective of the working class and people who aren't completely delusional it's still very much alive and strong in the minds of those that have consolidated control of the political system and the political system is completely uh, under the spell and in control of the professional managerial class. And they're not done with their efforts. They're continuing to work on creating technical solutions to these problems. And one of the problems they see is that these working class people just don't get it. They just don't get their genius that, they just need to be managed and that it's their terrible decision-making and lack of expertise that is the cause of all the world's problems. And if they can just develop this globalized network of public-private partnerships and nudge units um, and a combination of pharmaceuticals and surgery and control over food and energy, that we will get the perfect organizational man yeah, and you know we can even change people's genomes in order to get rid of obstinate defiant disorder, et cetera. So I I think that the the elites there's still a significant percentage of them. I think some of them are just in full out grab as much as you can before everything falls apart, um, or just straightforward sociopaths trying to enrich themselves. But I think a lot of them are still very much under the spell of the managerial revolution imagining that star trek future that you mentioned um and i don't expect to convince you that in, in that short reply but if you haven't read ns lyon's uh, the china convergence that's that's essentially what influenced me to be able to articulate that in that way um it's very long it's like thirty-one thousand words but it's. Uh, I think you'd like it if you haven't checked it out. All right, I'll give. I'll give it a read. What I see consistently is that um, these bureaucratic creatures, the university professors, uh, government employees, um, uh, people who attend the World Eco Economic Forum, uh, who aren't business people, is that they're completely out of touch not only with um regular people but what with what their own class is doing uh so klaus schwab uh to get to the center of like the wf styles stuff probably the figurehead at least at least online of um people who who want to create this kind of thing a he's like 84 years old like um, he's older than than Biden and probably as senile. Uh, not an impressive figure in any stretch. And honestly, his um his fame is probably a marker of how much his influence has waned. That um he was almost certainly more powerful when no one had heard of him, and he was just running the WEF, like actually from the shadows in like the early two thousands. But um, part of this, part of my general optimism that these people are clowns who are floundering has been watching their effect on my own country. Um, Canada, 
in about 2021, 2022, you would have thought this country was a case study in the coming totalitarianism. Um, China convergence is almost the perfect phrase for what you'd think was happening in Canada, that um, the vaccine mandates were slowly becoming vaccine passports, were slowly becoming digital vac vaccine passports, that Canada was quickly converging on what was looking very much like a social credit state. And of course, the trucker rebellion arose, and at the height of the trucker rebellion, they started closing bank accounts and wanted to tie that to the vaccine system and were making statements along those lines. And it looked exactly like what you, what Alex Jones would have predicted of how a social credit system would come about. And then the regime fell flat on its face. Uh, the trucker, A, there was massive capital flight from Canada, Canada during um, the protests in Ottawa and the, the shutdowns of the borders by parallel tr trucker protests. And during that, that time, because they were shuttering bank accounts, just massive amounts of capital were fleeing Canada. And the bankers, uh, it's still very mysterious what was happening in the phone calls at the time between Trudeau and all the various power players in the country. But the general consensus I've seen, because Trudeau's declaration of emergency um, the way the Emergencies Act is structured, the Prime Minister can invoke the Emergencies Act, and then he has seven days to get it to pass through Parliament and then the Canadian Senate, which is this bizarre can of worms that um, I'll try to avoid getting into. Needless to say, it's not a very legitimate institution. It's, a, uh, it's appointments for life, so it's all these weird hangers-on from like decades ago. But um, basically what happened was Trudeau invoked the Emergencies Act. His um, loyalists in Parliament voted for it, and then he couldn't get it past the Senate. In fact, at the end, he had to withdraw the emergencies, his invocation of the Emergencies Act, before, like, hours before the one-week deadline to avoid, like, having it publicly be seen that he failed to pass pass it. Of course, everyone knew he failed to pass it. Yeah, so the I question was, why these why these regime sycophants and power figures, figures didn't approve it in the Canadian Senate? And the general consensus was that um, that Canada's industrial and banking elite rebelled against him. That, um, that this WEF consensus has very little purchase amongst the the Anglo uh, banking elite and business elite that um, basically they aren't going to accept any any consequence of this like European uh, EU dream of global socialism. They're going to accept any version of that the second it affects a dollar of their income income that they feel like they don't feel Klaus Schwab or any of these these Eurocrats can actually offer them any anything or that anything in their career actually benefits from doing anything for these people that indeed these um these figures that come out of the managerial revolution these kind of peak uh figures who bounce around between like government regulatory agencies and like businesses that want to suck up to them aren't actually that powerful. Like they don't have that much influence compared to compared to say central bankers or um or people who run major major banks and are actually tracking, you know, whether their portfolio is up up a billion or down a billion. That these managerial elites have very big meetings. They have huge events where they try to say, oh, we're going to reorganize the entire global economy around um, carbon credits or, or green is the future and all this stuff. And the bankers will, will fund stuff 
that looks like it's going to get a bunch of green credits, but they aren't actually going to accept anything that might actually hurt their portfolios. And you saw this immediately with Trudeau when he started freezing bank accounts. Not only were the, was the government of Alberta overthrown by by internal political man, maneuvers because the because of the trucker rebellion that now the premier of Alberta is the politician politician who most endorses the truckers. And not only did that happen in um, the federal conservative party where Pierre Polyev is now likely to be the next prime minister of Canada, who was the first politician after Maxime Bernier, our very, our um, far right libertarian um, also ran, who doesn't have a seat in the Canadian parliament. He endorsed the truckers and then immediately after him, Pierre Polyev endorsed the truckers. And he's now probably going to be the next prime minister in 2025. That'd be crazy. We'll see. I I would say, um, you know, that that's a huge white pill. And yeah, I I, wrote an entire piece on it um, called the truckers run it one. It's up on my, my blog. It's about, um, I think it's the second one from the top of all time. Most, most popular articles, but these WEF types, they wield a lot of power in Europe, but of course Europe isn't a power center. You know, all of Europe, Brussels, all of that is really subservient to the to the Pentagon and the US security state. And no one at the Pentagon and no one in New York finance actually gives a shit about Klaus Schwab or any of these um or any of these managerial revolution types who have like little busts of Lenin stuff and dream of a world that that's completely run by Star Trek managers. Uh, Oh yeah. But I would, I would say that they're, they're, they're cut from the same cloth. I, they, I agree. They don't care about what the WF says, but it's those same incentives, like that same desire to manage things technocratically because that's that's what our DOD does, you know. That's what uh, the central bankers do. Like that's all management, um, and it's all I think. So the you know, especially in terms of central banking, it's all a form of socialism. As you so know, the you know. managerial revolution, you have to distinguish between the types of management, and this is where I don't like Berm's term. I call it the bureaucratic revolution. Um, the types of management that came about during the managerial revolution and the types of management and so forms of social organization that existed before. So um, obviously military power, like um, the officer structure and the intense bureaucracy that forms around it in operations. Uh, even though the Pentagon and lots of institutions like that are infected with um, the tyranny of the committee and all these these nonsense figures, um, basically the entire structure of, of the military and how it, it manages itself was put in place by the time of Napoleon, like a hundred years before the managerial revolution. If you look at his marshals and his, his generals and, um, he himself came out of the, um, survey, the geographic and survey department, like a lot like the bureaucracy around militaries is it's a bureaucracy, but it's own it's its own complete phenomenon that's very separate from this um, managerial revolution and tied to very different incentives and different rituals. Uh, similarly with banking, uh, banking bureaucracies are amongst the oldest kind of complex business forms uh, really came into their own in the 19th century same with um insurance and lots lots of institutions like this they predate in a lot of ways this managerial this managerial bureaucratic revolution that is dependent upon the integration kind of the state creating private entities that aren't really private private entities and then then managing them they're they're continuous with this phenomena. So like, obviously 
banking is one of the most one of the institutions of society most integrated with like government regulations but it's a very separate ph phenomenon that i'd say predates it you can look at say like stuff written in the 1950s about banking in england and it looks very similar today to today and it looks very different than what you saw in like the 1930s 19, 1940s where you had like this complete university takeover of all these all these institutions and that's why i'd say those two phenomena uh, the military and banking are going to outlast the managerial revolution Lucian that Burnham identified, and B probably wield a lot, a lot more power and a lot more historical import than a lot of these Klaus Schwab, Schwab international economist university professor types. Oh, no doubt. I just I think that they kind of feed off of one another because the their moralizations for their their purpose. Uh, Overlap to some degree. Um, we've been going uh, for a couple hours. I got I got a roll. Um, oh, we can, oh, sorry. We can, no, no, we can. I'd, I'd love to continue talking, especially on this topic. Maybe if you can, uh, if you're working on that uh, synthetic objective paper, maybe uh, if you if you get that out, um, we can we can discuss that in the future because it, it'll relate, I think, uh, back to this. All right, I. I... I wouldn't hold my breath on that just because that's something like I'm, I have a whole pipeline of stuff I need to put out and that's way, way down the, I'm, the list hey, I'm in not, my hypotheticals. I'm not, but, I'm not in any hurry, man. I'm not in any hurry. I'll be no, I'd love to come back to that and um, any other, other things that catch your eye. No, this has been a ton of fun. Yeah, likewise. Really appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording and then we can uh, say our proper goodbyes. All right.